Hey, this is Alan Gassman, and I am here with Rick Fee, and we're going to talk about hot topics and best strategies for estate planning. This is a new series. We are celebrating a, a platform and arrangement with a very worthy charitable organization, Kettering Health Foundation. Rick and I have known each other for years. So, Rick, do you want to tell us just a little bit about Kettering Health Foundation and, and why we're here today? Sure, sure. Thank you, Alan. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, uh, Kettering Health Foundation is the supporting arm of the Kettering Health system. And uh, let's see, uh, we're located in southwestern Ohio. Uh, our namesake is Charles F. Kettering. And we um, pride ourselves on our uh, level of innovative care uh, based on his innovative spirit. Um, for instance, you can thank Charles Kettering if you, you start your car in the morning with your electric starter, if you have air conditioning in your house, um, if you um, if children in under care, maybe one of the first developers of like uh, um, the uh, models that they use in NICU for, for, for children when they're, when they're uh, struggling. And also uh, he was one of the pioneers in the MRI imaging. So it's a great heritage. The foundation uh, has at its core a mission of really developing partnerships that generate re gifts and other resources uh, enhancing the, the, uh, our ability to provide care in our catchment area, which is about 13 counties here in Southwest Ohio. And basically to also we're aligned with really improving the quality of life in our community through education and healthcare. And part of that is partnerships and, the, and this uh, collaboration with, with Alan and others that'll be joining us over the next uh, few months is, uh, is a testament to those partnerships and what we can do to leverage ourselves in the community. So. Um, over the next several months, uh, we have uh, put these in on an every other month basis, uh, and you can see the schedule here uh, with the topics that will be coming up, along with uh, the various presenters. And at each one of these, um, I'll have a more of a moder moderator role with Alan as he bring it, brings in some familiar faces that I've uh, worked with in the past. Very so good. Big, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then speaking of charitable giving and techniques and knowledge, look at the initials Rick has here. He's got an MA, CAP, CFRE, CHFC, CLU, CWS. So if we had an extra 15 minutes, we could explain what all those things mean. <laughs> what this means was that Rick was, was a very, very accomplished financial advisor. He and has a real thirst for knowledge and has a lot of knowledge. So. Um, Kettering, is, Kettering is very happy, lucky to have you both from a management standpoint and from a knowledge standpoint. So thanks for thanks for turning tax dollars into charitable dollars. Mm, thank you, Alan. Thank you for those kind words. <laughs> so the sign up here, the, everything is free for all these webinars through April 20. And you can click at the bottom and you'll be enrolled automatically in all of them. And then if you don't show up, it's no problem you'll receive about two hours after the webinar, a video of the webinar that you can click on or you can go see them on YouTube. Or if you wanna register only for an individual webinar, you can do it on the right-hand side. Uh, Tuesday, August 23rd with Jonathan Blotmacher, the greatest estate planner in the world, in my opinion, underused strategies for estate tax planning. You've got information on the Ketterling system, now, if you have not been on one of these webinars on this platform, if you have a question, then all you have to do is go to the question panel that you see there on the uh, on the rectangular thing, click on the inverted pyramid, and then type in your question. And we will be sending everybody slides. Uh, Brittany, people are saying they don't have the slides, but you'll be able to see the slides and we will uh, be uh, sending you the slides if you have not received them and also i will go ahead and send some spreadsheets that everybody can use and because people say to me well i don't know how to use excel and i'm not sure how the estate tax system applies to me so uh, you can send this spreadsheet to your client and they can go ahead and in the white here put in their present net worth so let's just say that it says six million, but they're worth seven million. So all they have to do is uh, click up to on net worth until they get to seven million or seven and a half million. And then their asset growth rate, I've got it set at 8% uh, here. And then how much are they saving a year? 
Well, let's say that they save 70,000 a year and they're gonna be working for the next 20 years. So where are they on the estate tax system? Right now, they don't have anything to worry about. In year six, they're gonna be worth about almost $11 million. If the estate tax exemption stays where it is now, where we have the original exemption plus the bonus exemption, nothing to fear, but if the exemption goes to half in 2026, they'll be at a million six estate tax. So this is just a nice spreadsheet to use. And uh, if the exemption went to half in 2022, which we certainly don't expect, then they would be paying estate tax earlier. So that is for a single person. And my staff says this is Allen proof because I don't have to type in any numbers. I could just use those arrows. So the next spreadsheet we have for you is just for a married couple. So everything's twice as big. But I, I don't know, a lot of clients really just like to know, well, if I'm now worth 10 million, and if I could save 150,000 a year for the next 20 years, and if the assets grow at 7%, well, my gosh, I'll be at 21 million in 11 years. And then at 45 million in 21 years, is that a mistake? And the answer is no. If you have a reasonably allocated stock portfolio, stock and bond portfolio, the average rate of return over the last 65 years is about 7% or 7.2%, which means it doubles every 10 years. And it's hard to get clients to get that into their mind, that this thing is going to double every 10 years. And that's why we need to use these estate tax planning techniques now and not 10 years from now, where it may have doubled. So that is the married couple spreadsheet for you. The next spreadsheet I have for you, and this is a hot topic, and that is the use of a Cupert. And people have more and more of their net worth in their primary residence these days. And in addition to that, they are more reluctant to move because of the COVID-19 atmosphere, because of how expensive it is to move, because of questions as to the quality of construction in the future. So the question is, are you going to put your home into a qualified personal residence trust? And of course, the, the client's question to back to you is, what does that mean? So in this Cupert chart, we show you at column three, the day one value of the home. Now for this example, we're using a married couple and they each put half of the home into a separate Cupert. So we take an additional 15% discount, which you don't need to do. But you could assume that this is one home worth a million nine going into a Cupert and that the home will grow 3% a year in value. Now, a lot of people think it should be 4%, 4% so I'll just move it up to 4%. And there you are, you've got a million nine home and in 10 years, it's going to be worth two million seven. Now, what is the rent value of that home? That becomes important because after the Cupert term, you're going to have to start paying rent if you want to stay there. And that's going to reduce your taxable estate. So I'm going to assume that the rent is 8% of the value of the home. Uh, and I'm going to assume that that money that the Cupert receives can be invested at a 7% rate of return. And uh, I went to Tiger Tables and I determined that for somebody age 74, doing an eight year Cupert where they can live in the home rent free for eight years, then the gift of a million nine home is only you going to use $961,000 of their exemption. So if they die in year nine, the home is worth two million six. They will have paid one year of rent of two hundred and eight thousand, which will be also out of their estate. So your the reduction of their estate is two million eight, and the estate tax savings seven hundred forty four thousand dollars. But they may ask you, well, what happens if I die within the first eight years? Well, then there's no savings. It's like you never made the gift, and the home is in your estate, but would you like to see a five-year Cupert? And they say yes. 
So I say, well, for a five-year Cupert, I could go back to Tiger, Tiger Tables, and that gift, instead of 961000 is going to be a million two gift in year five. So I'm going to bring the Cupert length to five years, and I'm going to change 961 to 1200000 And now my situation is, for example, if they die in year 10, then the rent that they will have paid, reinvested at 7%, will be a million seven. That's pretty good. So the estate tax savings is actually better because what this chart reveals is that a shorter Cupert can do better because the rent you pay is more important than the discount you take if you will run those numbers. But then the next question that the client asks is, what is the income tax cost? Because I understand I may not get a full step up in income tax basis when I die. So we have the income tax analysis here. The value of the home, let's say that the children sell the home at year uh, 10. The value of the home, 2 million seven. Assuming the tax basis is a million 655. Uh, the gain on sale, a million. The 28, the 30 percent capital gains tax, 300,000. You weigh that against the estate tax savings. You're still ahead, 687,000. In addition to that, we do let the clients know that in our opinion, and we are in the minority of this, but if you die during the Cooper term, you definitely get your step up. If you die after the Cooper term, you may still get your step up under the Grant or Trust rules. Most advisors who have studied this issue do not believe you get the step up. We've studied it. We must surely be wrong. We think we believe that you would get that step up. And we have more information on that, on why we think that when somebody dies and they are considered to be the owner of an irrevocable trust for income tax purposes, that the assets in that trust get a step up. Now, you may believe otherwise, but you should not tell the client there is no step up, don't take the step up, because if it turns out by case law later that you, they should have gotten the step up and you had them pay income taxes, uh, then that would not be a good thing. So we're in the minority on that, but that spreadsheet has been popular. Now, another- Alan, that's a good point. One quick comment. Can you, uh, can you speak to this as well? Where you, can you also do fractional? To, to hedge against premature death, can you use fractional interest or fractional, um, uh, re, you know, fractional interest of residents in these calculations? To if you set them up for different periods of time. Yes, you can back into them. You can back into them to get the. By the way, you do need Tiger Tables or Number Crunchers or one of the other software programs to decide what the use of the exemption is. But other than that, you can. You can use our spreadsheet. Now, here's a spreadsheet. This is the, we call it the equi equilibrium spreadsheet, but this is, am I going to run out of money spreadsheet? And should I toggle off grant or trust status? So this client has a $12 million net worth. She spends a million dollars on herself, charity, and her family. And she is pessimistic and would like to see what would happen if she gets a 2.4% growth rate, and she plans to live to 100 because her mother is 100, and her mother is, is going strong. So she doesn't want to run out of money. We started a $12 million net worth, and the growth is only 288000 She is owed a $4 million note from a trust that she set up, which is a defective grant or trust, and the part of the million is going to pay her income taxes. So as you see, over time, she is going to have a, an estate tax issue, but at, by the time she's 81, her estate's only gonna be 4 million. By the time she's 86, I'm sorry, by the time she's 90, it's 748,000. Now, some of these numbers are distorted because we're showing that she's getting 79,000 a year from the note payments, and then a payment of 4 million 659. So her real net worth is uh, showing up here under total estate at line K. 
And quite frankly, she wasn't happy with us. So uh, we nevertheless wanted her to gift down to 12 million and she was not comfortable with it. Well, I showed her that if we can get a 7% rate of return, which is what your average has been since you've been investing, then be fine. At age 100, you're going to have 17 million. But she still wasn't happy with it. So what we programmed into this document was, I'll take this back to 2.4 million. I'm sorry, I'll take this back to 2.4%. Because the other thing you can show her here, get this growth rate down, is we could take this note of 4,580 and convert it into a lifetime private annuity. And if we do that, I just blank that out, note would pay her $441,000 a year for the rest of her life. So based on that note, she would be able to have $441,000 at age 100. And she was, she said she, at first she wasn't comfortable with that, but we explained the estate tax that's going to, to apply if she, you know, look at the estate tax here. There's no estate tax after 2035. But if we go back to the note, the, the estate tax uh, is more uh, for, less formidable. With the annuity, it's more, more of an estate tax exposure. Uh, so this spreadsheet is just helpful. You're, we'll send it to you. You are welcome to use it. And one of the hot topics right now is whether somebody should use the rest of their exemption. And when you want to use that, that spreadsheet for the exemption. And when I talk about the rest of the exemption, I'm going to start calling it right now the bonus exemption. So as you know, in 2012, we got a $5 million exemption, which seemed like a whole lot at the time. And then it went up with inflation. And in the 2017 Tax Act, they gave us, they doubled it. And we call the base, the 5 million, plus the growth that it's had of about another million, which gets you to six. And then you have this temporary bonus exemption of another six. And so you've got an exemption of 12. So what happens is if you want to use it, if you want to use your bonus exemption, you the first money you gift off of the top comes from the bonus exemption and you don't get to your original exemption. So it would make sense for you to go ahead and gift six and know that you would have six left, but unfortunately that's not the way it works. That's the way we wish it worked. You have to give 12 to get down into that bonus exemption. So in other words, if I give, if my bonus exemption is six, my original exemption is six, and I make a gift of 8 million, then I've dug 2 million into my original exemption, so at least I've used that. And the bigger question, though, has been, what about the clawback? So you say, well, what do you mean, what is the clawback? Well. If I make a $12 million gift today, and then the exemption goes down in 2026 or earlier than that to 6 million, will I have to pay gift tax on the extra 6 million? Or when I die, will the base be based upon the 12 when I gave it or the six when I died? So Congress in the 2017 Tax Act informed the IRS that thou shalt issue treasury regulations, legislative regulations, which will explain when the clawback will apply and not apply. So the IRS came out with what they called the special rule. And the special rule is a good thing. You see the smiley face there, so you can remember, the special rule is a good thing. And it says that if I give it away, why, but while it's while the bonus is there, then to the extent that my gift exceeds the bonus, it digs into the original exemption. And when I die, I'm treated as if I had the whole 12 exemption to the extent of my gift. 
I'm not explaining this as well as I wish I was, but I think I'm giving you what I'm talking about. But there are, under the new regulations, which came out this year, exceptions to the special rule. And what the IRS said is, if you're making certain types of gifts, and you give $12 million this year, and you die in 2027, after the exemption has gone back down to six, then we're going to... We are going to treat you as if the exemption was six, not 12, at the time you gave it. And we're going to catch you. So you can avoid these rules by, very simply by dying before the exemption goes down. But if you don't die before the exemption goes down, this is going to be problematic. So, what kind of gifts are we talking about? The most important one is simply a gift which is a promise to pay. So let's say I have 20 million in my IRA. I don't want to take it out because I don't want to pay tax. I have my home and I would like to give my children $12 million to use my exemption in full. Well, because I don't want to raid my IRA or sell my home, I give them an enforceable promissory note. They give me something valuable consideration back Maybe they agree to read the book Catch-22 by Joseph Heller twice in the next six months. And in exchange for that, I've given them a $12 million gift. And now when I die in 2027, 20, uh, there will be no estate tax on the $12 million that I have to move to pay that, that note off when I die. I mean, the IRS says, no, 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 no. If you die based on that note, then six of the 12 million that your estate pays on the note will be considered to still be in your estate. So you need to tell your client, be able to pay that note before you die. And then the treasury says, department says, no, 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 no. You need to pay it in full more than 18 months before you die. So that person would have to go ahead and pull the money out of the IRA, pay the income tax, and they may or may not want to do that. The other place where you're going to get hurt severely is when you set up a GRAT or a trust or partnership or LLC arrangement where on your death, the assets are going to be included in your estate. Because if you die and the assets are included in your estate, not only are they going to include those assets in your estate, but they're going to take away the bonus exemption if you die after the bonus exemption goes away. So that is going to make it much more expensive. There are some exceptions to the exceptions, but I will tell you that they really are not very valuable. They don't do very much. But what I what I want to mention is the Graner Retained Income Trust. Because what the Treasury Department and Congress did was they said, take away the bonus exemption for these notes and for these 2036 retained interests. But they did not mention taking away the GST exemption or taking away the portability exemption. So let's say that I put a $12 million gift into a grant or retained annuity trust, which is simply by definition a trust which pays me income for my life. The trustee of the trust takes my gift and invests it in very low dividend or no dividend growth stocks. I get very few payments back from the trust. I file a gift tax return. The 12 million is out of my estate and I go ahead and allocate my $12 million GST exemption to the Grant or Retained Income Trust. And then I die in 2027 when the grit is worth $17 million. Well, the bad news for estate tax planning purposes is that the $14 million is in my estate and I only get the $6 million exemption because I lost the bonus exemption. But the good news for my grandchildren and great grandchildren and future generations is that 14 million, even though it's in my estate, 
it is GST exempt. So now I have a $14 million GST exempt asset that can benefit my descendants for their life and never be subject to estate tax. The other situation where this is going to apply, where you're going to want to understand the lifetime grit, is you have a client who lost their spouse and got a $12 million portability allowance. You know, it was sad they lost their spouse, but happy they got the portability allowance. And now they go and remarry somebody, the exemption's down, or the person they remarry is going to leave it all to children, and there's not going to be a portability ex allowance. And so the client would be well advised to go ahead and gift the portability amount out so that it's so that it's there so my spouse dies i gift 12 million then i remarry my new spouse dies leaves me a zero portability allowance it's a good thing i used the 12. the clawback rules do not touch the earlier use of the portability allowance so in this example, when the client says, no, I don't want to make that kind of gift, I may need the money. Well, gift it to a grat, I mean a grit. You'll get all the income for your lifetime, you can feel better about it, and then that will lock in your $12 million ex uh, portability exemption when, when you die. So even if you remarried and you lost the portability exemption, it wouldn't matter because you used it when you set up the grit. So for larger estates, that is um, going to be important. Another thing I wanted to mention is the use of the ECT trust. I don't think you've ever heard of this because we just thought of it last week. So a lot of us establish asset protection trusts or spousal limited access trusts where our clients are not going to be the beneficiary of the trust unless certain events occur, such as a trust protector adds us, or what is somewhat common is you set up a spousal limited access trust, which says my spouse is the beneficiary of this trust, not me, but on my spouse's death, I'm going to be added. And you set that trust up in an asset protection jurisdiction, such as Ohio, and then because you're not a beneficiary of that trust, it should not be subject to estate tax under code section 2036A1. But what if you have the ability to run up debt and have that debt paid by the trust? Well, if you can run up debt and the debt can be paid by the trust, then in the German case and the OL case, UHL, we know that the IRS can say, hey, that trust is in your estate. So the question is, in jurisdictions such as Florida and Ohio, where you could run up alimony or child support, or in Ohio, you could, run, you could not pay your Ohio state taxes and have the state come into that trust, is that a retained interest under 2036A? Now, we hope it isn't, because the doc of the doctrine of independent significance, but it still might be. So if you want to be absolutely safe, you set that trust up in South Dakota, Alaska, or Nevada, where they don't have exception creditors. But the other idea that we had was when you set up that nice big slack, just put $500,000 into an exception creditor trust and provide in that trust, this is for my children, but if and when an exception creditor of mine would ever be able to reach into that $10 million slack, pay them first from this trust. And then in the slat agreement, I put a provision that says if this slat would ever be invaded by an exception creditor after the ECT trust has been spent down, then I will be removed as being a possible beneficiary under this trust. So now I have insulation. There is no way that a exception creditor can reach the slack. They'll first be paid from the ECT trust or the ECT compartment of the slack, if you want to compartmentalize this within the slack. 
And only then would they be payable from the SLAT. But if I'm no longer a beneficiary of the SLAT or a potential future beneficiary of the SLAT, then the ECT trust should provide plenty of, of cushion there, um, especially after taking into account uh, the act, acts of independent significance. Now, I'm working on an estate plan for a successful real estate entrepreneur. And people just forget that real estate works beautifully in a charitable remainder unit trust. And we're going to go over this in, in a future presentation for you. But when you talk to a client, and the client said to me, um, you know, I'm 65 and I plan to spend money until I'm 80. I want to benefit this charity. If I die, I want my spouse to continue to receive the rent. Well, what is the rent? The rent is about 5% of the value of the building after you take into account expenses. So, and then when you die, you want to leave it to charity. Yes, I do. Well, you realize you're not getting any income tax benefit right now on your million dollar building. But if you put your million dollar building into a 10 year, 5% charitable remainder unit trust, then you will get about a $600,000 income tax deduction multiplied by 40%. You'll get a check from Uncle Sam for $240,000 you will get recognition for having made a million dollar gift. And by the way, your children can manage the building and get paid an arm's length management fee. You'll have to strip the debt off of the building. If you have old and cold debt, you might be able to leave it on the building. But let's just remember that the Charitable Remainder Unit Trust has a lot of uses and a lot of people don't really recognize what those uses are when you have a business, when you have voting stock, when you have an S corporation, there are pathways to getting very nice income tax deductions while locking in a charitable remainder. And quite candidly, if your spouse isn't as charitable as you are, or your children aren't as charitable as you are, this is a way to get the fruit from the tree, but to get the tree to your favorite charity. So we're going to be talking about that and a lot of things you can do later. Uh, the final thing I wanted to mention, because this is a 30 minute presentation, is the applicable federal rate is way up there. Look at this, June, 2021, we were doing long-term notes at 2.08%. And now, if you wanna go with a long-term note, you've gotta go with 3.11%. That's a big jump. Now, if I could get a note done on a sale, an installment sale, before the end of June, I can use the April rate. You can go back two months. The July rate is going to be higher than the June rate, but you'll be able to use 2.66% and lock that in in a long term promissory note. And, and don't forget that when you're working with a married couple, you can for relatively little amounts, cause a self-canceling installment note to be put in place, and then the note disappears on death. So Fred and Wilma in January 2021 are uh, in their mid-60s. They could do a 21-year self-canceling installment note at 3.2%. So the premium was about 3%. So now they could do a 6% 21-year note. And then on the, if they both die within the 21 years, never, their children pay no federal estate tax. So Rick, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was just make sure that I finished on time. It is 1234. As I said before, uh, we are going to retransmit the video of this presentation in about two hours, thanks to the technical expertise of Brittany. Thank you, Brittany. And that will be emailed to everybody who signed up for the course. So you can watch this as many times as you like, and it will also be posted to YouTube. Please make sure that you join us with Jonathan Blotmacher, August 23rd, for underused strategies for estate tax planning. 
Thank you very much for supporting Ketterling Health Foundation. And Rick, any final words here? Unmute. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alan. As always, your topics are always current, poignant, and um, and the timing is and, and the timing is in, impeccable on these. We appreciate the content of them. Uh, I also encourage that uh, these are building up to a crescendo moment for us in the spring, uh, when we will be having a live session for our estate uh, planner, estate and tax planners conference here in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, I think there's a slide more to on May 18th. There it is, Thursday, May 18th, and 20. Uh, 23. So we look forward to uh, seeing you there. And uh, we'll, as we unfold that with our speaker schedule, as our speaker schedule starts to build, or our day starts to build, we'll, we'll inform you of that. So thanks everyone for attending and really appreciate your support. Thank you very much and may the rest of your day be all billable. Yeah. <laughs>